In this lecture, we'll cover microscopy, staining, and direct examination of specimens in clinical microbiology. Now, as you recall, there are a variety of different microscopes. Now, as far as within the world of microbiology, the microscopes that are used will be either a bright field microscope. And so with a bright field micro microscope, that just kind of shows you an image against a brighter background. So um, this top image here would be an example of your bright field microscope image where you're looking at bacteria that is stained by a gram stain and you've got organisms that are staining gram positive and gram negative. An electron microscope is just usually just going to be used to visualize the viruses. But you can see here in this image where um, you can see those various bacteria in some sort of source um, there where you can view it via that electron microscope. Now, phase contrast microscope, this is when the light actually passes through and reflects based on the thickness of the actual specimen source. And so then what you see is actually um, areas of contrast. And so this is best for the direct observation of unstained specimens. So you can see an example here where we have that phase contrast and you can see those organisms where they're kind of highlighted around the edges of the organism. Um, just where you can kind of just see that different contrast reflected there. A dark field microscope, the Im image is luminous against a background with little to no light. Um, this is primarily going to be for your thin specimens, but um, also just to view your spirochetes. And so you have an example here where you can actually see that little spiral corkscrew type of design um, of those organisms. And then we also can use a fluorescent microscope. And so your fluorescent microscope uses fluorochromes that will actually absorb light in an ultraviolet range. And then it will actually emit that visible light at a longer wavelength. And so fluorescent microscopy is going to be used for something like your ANA. So here you can see where um, you have that different pattern staining with your um, cells on your ANA. So you can see there's just some variations there. And of course, based on that particular pattern is how you report it out and ultimately you're able to diagnose. Now, there are a couple of different type of microscopy procedures that can be performed in the laboratory. Um, one of the ones that we discuss is doing a direct micro microscopic examination. So this is when you actually make a smear directly from the primary source. So whatever the source is that was sent to you that you are now culturing. So whether it's a swab or a fluid of some sort, you're making the smear directly from that source. So it's not like you're taking it from an agar plate where the bacteria is grown. You're taking it actually from the patient sample um, and wherever that sample was collected from. So obviously we're going to be looking for the presence of various cells as well as bacteria and parasites. Now, the purpose of doing a direct smear would be to provide information regarding the effect infection to assist in the patient management. So what this will actually do, it will kind of help guide that workup of that specimen. It will assess the quality of that specimen. It will give you a primary identification of whatever particular organism is in there. And then identification of potential pathogens um, that may not be able to be cultured. So depending on what your specimen type is, you could see something on that direct examination that you um, you can see that organism there, but that organi organism cannot be cultivated in your typical medium. So um, it would alert you if you've got something on the gram stain but not growing on the culture plates that you're dealing with something that's a little bit more fastidious and unable to be cultured routinely. Now your direct examination methods, um, you've got a few different ones that are used. There's a saline mount, and what this will do is actually detect the bacteria and parasites um, in that specimen. So an example of this would be a wet mount, a vaginal wet mount that is done on a female patient where they're looking for that bacterial vaginosis or um, the presence of the bacteria or something like trichomonas, yeast, anything like that. Um, uh, another example, even though it's kind of suspended in urine, um, would be doing looking at urine, looking for the bacteria, things like that. Uh, iodine wet melt. And so with iodine wet melt, we do this, we use this to look for the ova and the parasites in stool specimens. And those, um, 
those organisms or those eggs or whatever will actually dye like a orangey brownish type of color so it actually helps them to kind of stand out um, potassium hydroxide so this will actually look for various fungal elements in skin hair nails um, you can also use the potassium hydroxide when you're doing a wet mount vaginal wet mount um, and what that does is it will actually dissolve the cells um, like the hair cells the nail the cells that make up the nail bed skin um, any of your epithelial cells and what that does is actually removes those to allow for better visualization of those fungal elements an ND ink test and so what this does is use that ND ink to actually be able to visualize the capsule around the outside of that cryptococcus um, yeast organism and then you've also got a quelling type of reaction test and what this does is actually looks for particular bacteria that have uh, capsules within them um, or capsules on them and it actually looks for a swelling of that capsule um, with that bacteria now this is an older method it's very tedious so it's not really done a lot since it has been replaced with newer methods um, to actually detect these particular organisms all right so for indirect microscopic examination um, this is going to be more for um, when you're looking at something a specimen that is coming from maybe like the culture plate or the broth medium that it was um, that it's been isolated in and so with those specimens um, you're typically going to stain those now you could do a gram stain off of a direct specimen as well um, but we're just going to kind of elaborate a little bit more on um, indirect specimens as far as taking it straight from like your culture your actual culture or your culture broth so for a simple stain what we are using is a methylene blue and for these stains we're just looking for size shape and morphology and really this is only used when you're kind of um, looking for the metachromatic granules that are associated with um, something like the carinobacterum diphtheria uh, your differential stains would include something like your gram stain and so what this is going to do is differentiate one particular organism from another particular organism so with a gram stain we do it based off it being gram positive or gram negative which has to do with that makeup of that cell wall so with a gram stain we're going to look at things like size shape the morphology as well as the particular reaction so when we're looking to call it whether it's gram positive gram negative and then of course you have some other little variations in there like gram variability and things like that now some of the other stains that are used within micro would be acid fast stains so if you're looking for bacteria that have that thicker waxy type of wall that won't retain that stain properly with the gram stain then you they would be considered an acid fast bacteria and so you would need a special stain to stain those um, and so those images depending on the stain um, but most of them are going to have this kind of greenish um, teal look to it with the organism itself staining with that um, bright pinkish red type color you can also have fluorescent stains so you have certain organisms that um, take up that fluorescent stain um, when you're looking at it you will see that obvious fluorescence depending on the particular stain you do have some um, fungal type elements that you could use the the um, Califor stain the Califor white stain and you can see where it's kind of like this bluish type of um, staining here in this image but you can see the others where you can see those organisms fluorescing with your fungal stains there are a few different fungal stains so here we just have a couple of examples of the lactophenol cotton blue where you can actually see those um, fungal type elements um, where you have the actual um, spores and things on the end of that particular fungal element that have that bright or that like blue staining color there and then beside it you have the um, the methamine silver stain and so you can see those various fung fungal elements there that kind of reflect with that silver color and then we have our various antibody conjugated stains which obviously would use um, antigens and antibodies to do some sort of um, labeling with that particular enzyme and so here you, we have an example of just a direct uh, fluorescent antibody type of staining that has been performed 
So when we look at the outside of the cell or the cell envelope, we're looking at an outer membrane for the gram negative, and then you have a cell wall. So the gram positive has a very thick peptidoglycan layer, whereas the gram negative has a thinner layer. So the gram negative have that outer membrane as well as that thin layer. And then your acid fast bacteria have a waxy substance that is on the outside of that bacteria. Then you have the perioplasma or the perioplasmic space. Um, and this was in, within your gram negative. And so this contains a gel-like substance that helps to capture nutrients. And it also contains enzymes. And then you have the cell membrane or the cytoplasmic membrane. And so this is the deeper layer of the cell and it contains proteins and enzymes that are vital to cell metabolism. And it also serves as an osmotic barrier. So now we'll look at some of the different components of bacterial cells. And so with bacterial cells, they do have um, internal structures within the bacteria, even though we can't really see those, they are there. And so here's just an example of um, the bacteria itself where you have the wall, the outside cell wall. And then once you get internal into it, then you've got um, the different structures that are internal. And this can even be further broken down into those structures containing the DNA. So here you have um, an image with that um, gram positive versus the gram negative. And so you can see that peptoglycan layer for your gram positive, whereas your gram negative, it has a very thin layer, but then you also have that outer cell wall. And so some of your organisms can actually have a capsule um, on the outside of that that cell, that bacterial cell. Some of them are able to form slime type layers and then some of them can also create those biofilms. Um, and we saw that image on a couple of slides back where you can have one particular organism or several organisms that create that biofilm. Some organisms actually have some sort of appendage to it. So it may have flagella or or phyla that help it with attaching. So with the capsule, that exterior layer that protects the bacteria, um, it actually helps it from being attacked by um, the immune system and it also helps to make those biofilms. And then with phyla, you have the hair-like projections around the um, outside surface and so it helps with the attachment of that organism and then some of them also have motility so they're able to move with the flagella and so depending on the location of the flagella um, it actually can have a term with that placement so if it's polar it just has one single flagella whereas um, the more flagella that it has, or depending on the location of it, it changes that term. So with a gram stain, um, this is the most used stain within the laboratory for viewing and differentiating bacteria. And so what happens with this is that when you use the stains with it, so with your crystal violet, um, stain, it forms a complex with the iodine, and so this will be present in your gram-positive organisms, whereas your gram-negative organisms do not have that thick peptidoglycan layer, so they are not able to retain that um, iodine complex to stain that purple color. So with this, they would be gram-negative and they would be pink. And so what you have is a primary stain, which is your crystal violet, a mordant, which is your Graham's iodine. Then you use a decolorizer, and then you use a counter stain, which is a saffron, which is a real pretty pink color. And so your results would be a Graham positive, which stains the deep shade of purple, and you can see that image here, or Graham negative, which stains pink. 
So you should be familiar with this procedure. Um, you will not have the opportunity to perform a gram stain this semester, but when you do your fall semester class, you will do a gram stain. And so what happens with the gram stain procedure, you will prepare a slide with your organism straight off of the plate or with a direct culture, so from a sputum culture or a swab. And so once you have put that sample onto the slide, you allow it to dry, and then you will fix that material to the slide um, either by a heat fix type method or with something like methanol. Then to actually stain your slide, once your slide has cooled off if you've heat fixed it, then you will flood the slide with crystal violet and you'll let it set on the, side, the slide for um, a few seconds to a minute. It will depend on the manufacturer of the reagent as to what the timing is. But once it has set, then you will rinse that off with water and then you will flood the slide again with the iodine. And this allows that um, crystal violet iodine complex to take place. And then after you've let that sit for the allotted amount of time, then you will rinse it off. And then from there, you will use the decolorizer. And so with the decolorizer, you don't want to over decolorize and remove too much of that dye. But you also want to be sure to remove the dye from your gram negative um, bacteria to allow them to absorb that saffron. And so by doing this step, you will um, run the decolorizer over the slide and you will watch it run off the slide until it no longer produces any of that purplish blue dye. And so once that um, runs clear, then you will rinse that slide off and then you will flood it with the counter stain or the saffron and let that sit and then you will rinse that off and let it either air dry or you will um, press it between paper to dry off any of that moisture. And then after it is dried, you will look at it on the 100x objective or that would be a thousand magnification and this will be your oil objective. And you're looking for any sort of white blood cells, red blood cells, bacteria or anything else that may be present. And so here again, it just goes through um, the process that's taking place with the crystal violet. Everything is stained purple. And then once you add the iodine, you form that crystal violet iodine complex and it will stay within the gram positive. But once you decolorize it, it will be removed from the gram negative. And then your saffron is your counter stain. And so that will stain your gram negative, that pink color. If you over decolorize the specimen, um, you've let that decolorizer run on that sample too long. So the, when you're running it over and you see that purple color come out and it kind of stains that decolorizer, a purplish bluish tint, um, if you keep putting that decolorizer on it after you see that it has started to run clear, then you'll actually start to remove the color from the gram positive, which could in turn, they would get stained and they would appear gram negative. With your gram variable bacteria, you have intermittent type staining. And so this would be where you have gram positive and gram negative. And this can be due to the particular organism um, where maybe it's got some sort of capsule or something around that cell, or um, it could be something like the patient's been treated with antibiotics, so the organism could be dying, it could be the age of the culture. So there are a lot of things that can cause that gram variability. And so what that would look like would be something like in these two images where um, you've kind of got a little bit of that purple color, but you've also got the dark, dark red color rather than pink. And so they get a different kind of shade to them. And um, so this is where you could, 
your training and recognizing what the bacteria look like will help you to be able to detect when something like this has happened. Here we have just a couple of images of some different uh, gram stains that I just kind of want to cover with you. So here in this top image, we do have what we call a yeast. And you can see here where there is um, a lot of this pseudohyphae that's taken place. You can see how you have these pseudohyphae kind of stretching out a little bit away from these organisms. And then you also have a few that have this little budding that's going on. So you just kind of have that organism where it's a little bit larger than your gram positive, but it just kind of starts to pinch off where it starts budding off into that daughter cell. Um, and so with your gram positive coxa, they're a lot smaller. So you can kind of see the difference here where uh, this image, we got the gram positive coxa uh, that are in clusters. And so you can see some of those various clusters here, um, but they're very they're much smaller and you don't have that little pinching in the middle like you do with the yeast. Now we have another gram positive cocci here in this bottom image. It is a streptococcus and so you can see that chaining. Um, this particular image, the coloring of it looks a little off. Um, it's got, it looks kind of like it maybe it was a little bit over decolorized. It's not as that bright purple that we like to see. And you can also see a little bit of that spacing in between those cells. Um, and that's pretty characteristics of their streptococcus where when they start chaining like that. Your gram negative bacteria, um, you can see some of those here on the left. And then, um, so this is gonna be your gram negative. And then over here to the right, you have some gram positive. So you have the bacilli in the pink as well as the purple. Um, you can kind of see there's a little bit of difference in the size of them. Um, this particular image here, it's kind of hard to see that these are rods because they're so small. Um, and this is where your microscopy skills will come in of doing that focusing to make sure that you can actually uh, see the outside edge of those cells to make sure that they are, uh, in fact, rods. So not only do we look at how it stains as far as gram positive or gram negative, but we also look at the shape and arrangement of the bacteria. So they are very small bacteria, um, but they can come in different shapes. So you have cocci, which are, are circular, circular looking organisms, um, cocobacilla, which are bacilli that are kind of oval shaped, so they're a little elongated. You have bacilli, or um, some people also refer to these as rods, so they're more of a rod shape. A fusiform, which is pointed on the ends. You can have them have a bit of a curved shape to them, or they can have a spiral shape to them. They can also be arranged in singles, pairs, groups, so you could have tetrads. So if you look at the image here, you can see some of your cocci where you've got um, just a single one versus a diplococci, which are two. Um, sometimes they can be encapsulated. You can have them in groups or clusters. So you can see a group with the staphylococci, tetrads and groups of four, and then you can also have them in chains. And so here you see the streptococci that are in chains. With your bacilli, um, they also can be in the same formation or similar formation. And then you can also see on the side where you have your fuse your fusiform type bacteria where it's kind of got pointed ends. And then at the bottom, you can see your spirochetes or your corkscrew formed of bacteria.